Thank you, Andrew, and good morning, everyone, and welcome to the summit today. Uh, our topic today is pricing is strategy, and my aim today is to help you improve the profitability of your business by pricing better your products and services. Now, there's always a challenge to increasing prices, which means you might potentially lose sales or even customers, and so you need to take a strategic approach to pricing, which is understanding your client's needs and desires and finding ways to increase the value that you give to your customers and the benefits of that you can capture through increased pricing. Now, whilst there's a strategic element to pricing, there also is some wins that you can make in your business and improve your margins by moving perhaps to, from a more reactive approach to pricing um, to a more systemized approach that I'm going to take you through today. I'm also going to warn you against the, the perils of discounting and promoting pricing competition in your industries. But my main aim for today is the topic of pricing is vast, and I'm not going to be able to cover all the principles that may be applicable to your business. But what I'm hoping is that I will pique your interest in the subject of pricing, uh, and it's both an art and a science, that you'll want to go on a journey to learn more about how you can improve the profitability of your business through better pricing. So to get you on that journey, there's two books that I reference in the, the presentation today. And so to get you on that journey, uh, the, the books Confessions of a Pricing Man by Herman Simon and World Class Pricing by Paul Hunt and Jim Saunders um, are good starting points if you want to start reading more about the science and art of pricing. All right, price is the most effective profit driver in your business. And to illustrate this, I want to take you through a quick example. So on your screen, you'll see a, a company here. It's got a product. Let's call it a particular type of power tool. It sells it for 100 Rand. It has a cost of sales for that particular item of 60 Rand. It does a million Rand in, in units per annum. So 100 million in turnover, 60 million cost of sales, leaving it with a gross profit of 40 million. That's a 40% gross profit margin. Uh, it has fixed costs of 30 million, leaving it at a 10 million profit with a 10% net profit margin. So a business with a 40% gross profit, 40%, a 10% net profit margin is not atypical for a business. Now what I want to do is I want to change each one of these variables. Price, volume, variable cost, and fixed cost. So keep everything constant and then change price by 5%, everything constant, change volume by 5%, and let's have a look at what the results are. So a 5% improvement in the price will improve the profitability of this business by 50%. A 5% improvement in the variable costs, i.e. a reduction in variable costs from 60 Rand to 57 Rand, would have a 30% impact on, price, oh, sorry, on profit. A 5% increase in volume from a million to a million and 50,000 units would increase profit by 20%, I think it is. And your fixed costs, if they fell by 5%, it would improve the profitability of this business by 15%. So what we can see here is that price is your most leveraged opportunity to increase the profitability of your business. And therefore, it deserves a lot of time and consideration as to how can you optimize the price in your business. And we're going to talk a little bit more today about how you go about doing that. All right, but before we go about how optimizing you can optimize your price in your business, let's warn you about the perils of discounting. Now, I know all of you in the room are way smarter than the management team at General Motors in America and wouldn't fall into this kind of discounting behavior, but this story serves as a warning should any of you ever be tempted to do this. All right, so we're in 2005. Sales have been falling in April and May for General Motors. Volumes were 7% down in April compared to April in the prior year and 5% down in, in May. 
So the management team at General Motors were worried about this and they decided we need to get our sales up and increase our volumes. And so we're going to launch a special promotion. And this promotion is we are going to give a deep discount on all our cars and we're going to be telling everyone on the market price that they can buy their car for the same price that General Motors sells the car to their dealerships. Well, the campaign was an unbelievable success. Sales surged 41% up in June, 20% up in July. General Motors was so concerned that they actually were going to run out of motor cars. Such was the demand. But what happened was their competitors then responded. So Ford and Chrysler then also came out with aggressive discounting policies, which negated the benefits that General Motors had experienced in the months of June and July. And so things started going awry. In the next two months, sales fell precipitously. And you know, that was part of the competition with their competitors, but it was actually an early indicator of a much bigger problem, which was this. Sales remained extremely down for the remainder of the year. And so what had General Motors actually done? They hadn't stimulated any new demand for their cars through the discounting program. All they had done was get future buyers to come and buy in June and July at the cheaper prices, and as a result, for the remainder of the year, demand was significantly below what it should have been. And so this is known as the pantry effect, right? where you offer a very big discount, your customers come out and they buy and hoard up the stuff in the pantry, and then afterwards your volumes drive or dry up, and all you've really achieved is uh, getting all your customers to come and buy at your lower prices. The net impact on General Motors of this uh, discounting campaign was they lost $10 billion in their financial year in 2005. So the trap that General Motors fell into was the obsession with market share. General Motors is the biggest manufacturer in America, and they're obsessed with always remaining the biggest motor manufacturer in America. And so they were prepared to risk profits to ensure their market share or grow their market share. Now, this is where strategy comes in. That is not a great strategy. In your business, your strategy should be to grow profits, not market share. If you can grow market share and profits, great, but don't grow market share at the expense of the profitability of your business. All right. Let's have a look at this table. This is a useful little sort of check sheet. So on the left-hand side are potential discounts you could offer your customer. Across the top is your gross profit margin that your business runs on. So if you have a 40% gross profit margin and you decide to give your customers a 10% discount, that means you need to increase sales volumes by 33% to break even on that deal. Obviously, the lower your gross profit margin, if we move out to 30% and give a 10% discount, you'd have to get a 50% increase in volumes to break even on that deal. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't be using discounting in your business. It's just that when you decide to discounting, you need to be aware of the perils and accurately measure what are the outcomes you need to be getting for that promotion or campaign to have been successful. All right, there are three individuals on your screen, an accountant, a lawyer, and an engineer. And I want to share an experience that I've had about how these three individuals price their services in the marketplace. So I go back to when I was working at KPMG, and we got an assignment from ESCOM where they wanted us to check their decision to replace the generator sets at the Arnott power station. Now, I know what you're all thinking. KPMG, <laughs> Eskom. <laughs> I must have been involved in something dodgy here. But this was in 2001, long before KPMG started organizing Gupta weddings. So there were two parts to this um, uh, feasibility. One was a financial, feasi financial part, which I was involved in, and the second was a technical part. 
where we needed to A, assess whether the decision to replace the generator sets was the right decision, and then if it was the right decision, whether the solution that was on the table was the appropriate solution. And so we seconded some engineers in from KPMG's consulting business to do the technical part of the assessment. And the thing that I will never forget about this particular assignment was the difference in charge-out rates. My charge-out rate was four times that of the engineers, and I was flabbergasted as to why there was this difference. So first I thought, you know, is it a skill thing? You know, I've got a lot more skills. And the answer to that was a resounding no. I would have argued that the engineer had a far more skills than I did. And then I looked and said, well, is it that the value we were adding to this piece of the assignment was higher? And again, the answer was no. The critical piece of this assignment was whether it was the right decision to replace the generator set. If it was the right decision, the financial viability was easy because it's a lot cheaper to replace a generator set than build a new power station. So it certainly wasn't value, it certainly wasn't skill, so what was it? And the answer comes down to the difference between how accountants price their services compared to engineers. And so somewhere in the past, long history, accountants were able to anchor their pricing point at a much higher level than their more learned colleagues, the engineers. Nothing to do with value. Now, that brings us to our friend, the lawyer. What do we all know about lawyers' fees? <laughs> hey? They're horrifying, I'm here. <laughs> In fact, lawyers' fees sometimes are so high that these certain people have, you know, called lawyers sharks. But I have a different thought for you. So when you receive that invoice from your lawyer the next time, I'd like you to look at it and admire them for their skills in pricing. <laughs> so the lesson from this story is that the prices in your industry may already be set because of the forces at play in your industry. And so some industries have much more powerful forces at play that drive down pricing. One of those forces is rivalry amongst competitors and, you know, how they're undercutting each other. But as Michael Porter shares, there's other forces that push down profitability and pricing in an industry, such as your buyers, your suppliers can push pressure on your pricing, but also the threat of new entrants or your customer's ability to find a substitute for your product or service. And so that's a reality that we have in you know, the industries that you work on or work in. And so that's where strategy may need to come into play. So when we're looking at strategy, the first part is when you're setting pricing for your business, you need to set them thinking about your industry as well. Because strategically, it may be better not to grow your market share in your industry and risk causing a pricing war and driving down pricing and profits, not only for yourself, but everyone in your industry, just as General Motors did in their industry back in 2005. There's obviously a caveat to that, and that is called the Competition Act. Right? So you're not allowed to collude with people in your industry to protect prices and margins, but you can be a responsible player in your industry. Other ways you can tackle this strategically is to position yourself where the forces are the weakest. And so there's a wonderful example of this company called Packard and how they did that in the U.S. truck market. The truck market in the USA is extremely competitive and truck manufacturers do not enjoy good prices and high margins. And the reason for that is how the industry is structured. The big logistics companies that buy lots of trucks, those trucks are a big part of their cost. And so they really are focused on trying to drive down pricing of the trucks that they buy. The truck manufacturers are in a bit of a bind because they need those big volume orders to fill their factories, and so they are in a weak position and end up having to get lower prices and lower margins. So Packard looked at their industry and said, 
there's a sector of this market where pricing pressure is less. And that sector is the owner truck driver. So in America, a lot of truckers or trucks on the road are owned by the truck driver themselves. And so they obviously have less pressure that they can bring on their suppliers of trucks because they're only buying a single truck. So Packard looked at the segment but made sure it understood its customers' needs and desires. So these individuals, this truck is their life. You know, it's their income, they probably spend most of their life in the truck. And so the ability to tailor this truck to their own tastes and needs is actually very important for these individuals. So Packard focused on that segment of the truck market and allowed its customers to you know, zoot up these trucks with all the bells and whistles. And as a result, it was able to achieve better pricing and better margins in the US truck market than the more regular truck manufacturers could. So strategically, you maybe need to think about where do you position your business? And that comes back to your growth strategy map with the strategic question, where will you play? And can you find a place to play where there are perhaps better profits and better margins? As the old saying goes, there is profit in the niches. So that's a first concept for you. Your industry is going to have a big bearing on pricing, but that doesn't mean that there's not strategic consideration you can give to manage some of those challenges within your industry. All right, so what does pricing strategy look like in most businesses? All right, cost plus. All right, so for a lot of businesses, you take the costs of your products or services, you add a margin, and you get a selling price. Now, this methodology has a lot of advantages. One, it's based on something known, the cost. It ensures you get a positive contribution margin on every unit that you sell. And if your competitors in your industry also use a cost plus basis to price their products, you actually are probably going to get a relatively good level of pricing stability in your industry. The downside of the cost plus is if I've got a product that costs five rand, I mark it up by 100%, I sell it to my customers at 10 rand. There's a risk that at 10 rand, I might be choking off supply for that product or service in the marketplace. The other side, or the downside is, perhaps my customers were actually willing to pay 12 rand for that product or service, but now I'm selling it to them at 10 and losing all of that additional margin. So the risk of a cost plus basis is that you either may be too low or too high in your pricing. The next one is compared to competitors. So compared to competitors means we look at what our competitors are pricing at and we pitch our pricing somewhere either similar to our competitors or maybe at a slight discount or at a higher price to you know, what they're offering in the marketplace. Again, a very useful basis to be doing your pricing on. The downside risk of this is you're effectively outsourcing your pricing to your competitors. And you know there may be some different nuances in their business or what they're trying to do in terms of their strategy that's now going to be impacting on your business. Now, these, these methods are still valid, and you still need them as part of your pricing mix, so don't go and throw them out the window. What I want to do is add an element to how you approach pricing. And that is this equation here, price is equal to value. And value is perceived value in the minds of your customers. All right, so we all know this because people will spend $40,000 on a Louis Vuitton handbag. All right, the value of the actual object is probably not quite worth $40,000, but the perceived value is. So when it comes to prices equal to value, there's a formula that I'd like you to be thinking about in order to maximize this equation. The first one is create value. So how do we create value, which means having a deep understanding of the needs of our customers, and then creating products or services that meet those needs incredibly well. 
Because if we've created value, we'll be able to price better. The second one is communicate value. So it's no use having good value if you can't convince people to pay you for that value. And so this now comes down to marketing, brand, how do you communicate your sales messages, your marketing messages. And for some of you in the business, just the confidence to ask for a higher price. So it's creating value, but very important, we often don't think about this when we're thinking on pricing, is communicating the value. And what is your strategy around that? And then the final one is retain value. All right, so it's, you're not going to be able to get high prices in the market price if you're inconsistent or drop the ball in your product and services, because ultimately that's going to you know, diminish the perceived value of your products and services. So this is the add-on that I'd like you to start thinking about in price. You're going to come back and talk about value in a few minutes, but I want to share one or two other principles with you. A lot of you know this instinctively, but I thought it would be useful for you to see it in a graph format. So in, this is our power tool company we saw at the start of my presentation. So its optimal price to sell its, its power tool is 105 Rand. And at that price, this gray block of profit is its, at its maximum. If I reduce the price, whilst volume might increase, this gray block would be smaller. And if I increase the price, it would also be smaller. So that's the optimal price for them to sell their product or service. The challenge that they have is that at 105 Rand, there's a whole lot of customers who would only pay less who aren't going to buy. And that green block, or not a block, it's a triangle at the top, is the lost profit of the customers who won't pay 105 Rand. This green block here is these customers who actually want, were prepared to pay more. But because I'm only offering the product at 105, I've also lost that profit. So price differentiation is a strategy to look at how do I unlock these pieces of profit. Motor car companies do this very well. So if you're thinking of buying a car like a VW Golf, if you're like myself, you'll be looking at the entry level with a small engine and not a lot of features. All right, if you're like my wife, <laughs> she'll be looking at the other end of the scale, which is a GTI with you know, a big engine and lots of features. And so they've set up their products that there is opportunities to buy at different pricing points. What's obviously very critical here is you've got to have good fencing. Because if you've got a product that you're selling at 80 Rand and it's not much different from the product you're selling at 120, guess what else is going to happen? Everyone's going to be buying your 80, round, 80 Rand product. All right, I mentioned in the start of my presentation a more systematic approach to pricing. So this little graph or arrows on here is that approach. So I want to ensure that you move from a more reactive approach to pricing somewhere out to this side, which is the more scientific approach to pricing. So let's work through that. So the reactive approach to pricing looks a little bit like this if it's happening in your business. So we react to price changes. Costs go up and we react by increasing prices. Our competitors change prices, we react. Versus the other way, which is looking at that value equation. How am I creating value? How am I communicating value? Other features at the reactive stage is uncoordinated discounting. So if I come into your business and I find a whole lot of your small customers have the bigger discounts than your bigger customers, that would be an indicator we're not you know, getting control of all of the pricing that's happening in your business. And so to move out of the reactive stage to what I call the measured stage is a need to be getting a lot more data about what is actually happening with your prices and with your volumes in your business. So let's look at the measured stage. And there's three concepts I want to share with you this morning. The first one is called a pocket price waterfall. Then measure and report on your price and volume variances and then a little assessment tool called the five C's. All right, so what are pocket prices? 
So this is very relevant if you do offer discounts or differing discount structures to your customers. So pocket price is what you actually put in your pocket once the customer pays you. So there might be a price on the invoice, but then there's discounts and settlements discounts, and so the pocket price is what is in your pocket once the customer pays you. And so what you want to be able to do is measure the pocket price of your sales. And you can do that in one of these waterfall graphs. So if you look here, the first part of the waterfall graph starts with the standard list price. So if you offer discounts, you must have a standard, uh, standard list price from which you discount off. Some businesses don't do it that way. You come up with a price that has a discount embedded in it, and you quote and invoice the net price. If you're doing that, you've got no way of actually measuring what is happening from a discounting perspective in your business. So what you do need is you need to be able to see on your income statement every month sales at the full list price less the discounts you've given to give you your net selling price. You want to be looking at your sales if you discount just as the net sales because you can't then see the extent of the discounting that's happening in your business. So you need to have a list price. Then coming off the list price on this side of the, the, the graph here is what we call your on-invoice discounts. All right, so those are the easy ones. They appear on the invoice, the discounts that you've given your customer and we get to an invoice price. Then you need to deduct what we call your off invoice discounts, which are a little harder to measure. So off invoice discounts are cash discounts. You know, maybe it's a settlement discount, or if you pay cash, you get a better price. Cost of carrying the receivables. So if you give them credit, what's the interest cost for giving them the debtors? If you sell through retailers, often they want uh, advertising and merchandising discounts and stuff. You may offer an annual uh, volume rebate, um, and then any freight costs that you're giving them uh, need to be deducted, which gives you your pocket price. Now, what you need to do, and this is not a small exercise, but the benefits could be very material to your business, is you need to work out what this is per customer or group of customers. And then you need to graph it like this. So what is happening in this graph is on the bottom horizontal axis is the volume of this company's customers. And this is the discount or the percentage of list price they're paying. So what do we see in this business? Look at what's happening over here. Their smaller customers are getting the bigger discounts and their bigger customers are actually paying somewhere in the middle. And so this is a loss of profits happening here. And so what this company did was they got their sales team to go out and renegotiate the discount structures for these customers, and they were successful in 85% of the cases to move these prices up. Then what they did, they said, well, these are absolutely fantastic customers. And so they doubled down on increasing their volume of sales into these customer bases. And then they put in some tight rules around discounting with their sales reps so their graph didn't end up looking like that in the future. They managed to improve their pocket price by 3.6%. And as we saw in that graph I showed you earlier today, um, that it resulted in a 51% improvement in the profitability of the business. So here's the beauty of focusing on pocket prices is you don't have to increase your price. It's just eliminating any leakage that's coming after the list price in your business. If you sell a standard product or service, pocket price will give you more than sufficient information to measure your pricing performance. However, if in your business you sell a range, well, no, it's not sort of a range, your, there's a different service level per different customer, i.e. certain customers require more time and energy than others to serve, then you actually need to take this exercise a step further and calculate what we call pocket margin. So pocket margin is, you've seen this part of the graph, so we know how to get to pocket price, but then you need to deduct all the costs to service the, the customer. So obviously the cost, and well, let me give you the, what this company is. So this is a glass processing company. So they take big pieces of glass and cut it into smaller pieces of glass, and hence every job for a customer looks a little different. And so they obviously had a pocket price that took off the cost of the glass, which is their direct product cost. 
They then take off tooling costs, which are obviously specific to different clients, technical support, there's some other costs, and they arrive at a pocket margin. Then what they did was they graphed their pocket margin. So 3% of their customers were at, their pocket margin was 60% of list price. But then have a look what happens over here. There's a whole chunk of customers that are actually loss making. Now this is a reality in your business if you have customers that place different demands on your organization. Some of these customers may in fact be loss making. And so there's a need to work out your pocket margin and see if you are actually profitable on these customers. And again, this particular company, by focusing on this loss-making piece of their business, were able to increase their profits by 60% within a 12-month period. All right, so pocket prices, particularly if you're discounting, really valuable tool to get you finding easier ways than increasing your prices. The next one is price volume variances. So price volume variances are important because this is usually how we get sales information around changes on sales in our business. We get the prior and we get the current year and there's a difference and hopefully at least it's gone up. But that increase in sales is actually a function of two things, price and volume. And so it's important that you know if I've had an increase in sales of 58,000, which is what is that, how much of that was due to price and how much of it was due to volume. And so you need to be able to split out and calculate these two variances. So in this company's case, they actually decreased prices. So prior sales of 237 actually declined because of a reduction plus in price of 37,000. But that reduction in price, despite my warnings earlier, um, resulted in an increase in volumes. And so the net result was an increase in price. So why is this information important for you in your business? What this company has now started to learn is a little bit more insight into the relationship of their product when it comes to price changes and volume. So they can be a little bit more scientific the next time they come to price because they've got a little bit more insights. Now you can actually break this volume variance out into three further variances, a mixed variance. Are your customers buying more of your more expensive product or are they buying down? Customer count variance. Did you add customers in the last year or did you lose customers? And quantity per customer variance is, are your customers buying more from you? Now again, these are very insightful variances that are going to actually tell you what is happening in the volumes of your business. Because maybe the reason your, you know, your sales have dropped is your customers are all buying the same. There's just been a significant loss of customers. Now that's a very different set of investigation and actions than if all your customers were just buying a little less. Because that might be recessionary and market. Losing a whole lot of customers might actually be you doing a bum job. The information to do that is in your accounting system. You'll need someone who's really good with Excel to take that data, use a pivot table, and obviously knows how to calculate those variances to give you that information, but that information should be in most of your accounting system. So this is something you can access, and we do have a grow client that's very good at doing these kind of things for you, so if you get stuck, ask your coach. All right, the five Cs. So the idea behind the five Cs framework is as follows. We typically start with costs when we evaluate pricing. And that's absolutely important, and as I said earlier, you're not going to change that. However, the risk, as we mentioned, is that the increase in your costs isn't necessarily reflective of what you can price in the marketplace. And so the idea behind using this little tool for the 5 C's framework is just a systematic way of you thinking through your pricing decisions. And so it starts, obviously, with costs. Have your costs increased? What does that mean for your prices? Then it says, customer, what is the relative strength of your value proposition? Because if you've got a strong value proposition or increasing demand for your value proposition, you may be able to increase prices higher than your costs are rising. And I'm going to come back and talk about this value piece in a few minutes. 
Competition, absolutely. What are our competitors doing? Are they raising prices or prices falling? Capacity. In high commodity industries, capacity utilization is the biggest determinant of prices. So if there's lots of available capacity, prices will fall, and if there's not a lot of capacity, prices will rise. We saw that with Dr. Jamin earlier. No one has been making or building any new coal mines, and now there's a shortage of capacity, and so the coal miners are making buckets loads of money. And then the final one is conditions in the marketplace. So is the economy getting stronger or weaker? So for example, the Western Cape housing market is booming. And it's a wonderful leading indicator. 43% increase in new home building plans approved. Gauteng, on the other hand, not doing so well. So your ability to pass a pricing increase in the Western Cape market is probably going to be a lot easier to do than in the Johannesburg market. So by just working through these, it's giving you further insight other than just cost. Okay, cost is important, but if you're adding increased value, if capacity is in short supply in your industry, if there are favorable economic trends uh, for your particular industry, that may be an opportunity to price higher. Or it may be a warning that you can't pass all those cost increases off on your customers, otherwise you might experience a significant drop in volumes. So it just allows you to think through it. All right, now I've been promising you I'm going to get to value creation, so let's talk about value creation. All right, so I'm going to read you this little um, statement on the screen. So value-based pricing strategy entails superior knowledge of your customers' needs and desires and the ability of your company to provide an offering that delivers against these needs and desires. If the way you deliver against these needs is unique and valuable to the customer, You've created a competitive advantage in your marketplace, which will allow for better pricing and margins. So what does this mean? Creating value for your customers means you need to gain a deep understanding of their needs and desires. So you can create products that really meet those needs and desires, and if you do that, the benefit to you will be better pricing. And so this sits at the heart of strategy hence the title of my presentation. So if you're looking at the, the, the strategy map here, that question, how will you win? Your unique and valuable offering is the, the heart of better margins and better pricing. And so my challenge to you today is how much time are you spending in your business looking at that question around understanding our customer needs, which is your who definition, and finding a way to offer a unique and valuable solution. So it needs a lot of attention. Bringing you back to that first graph, you see the benefit of increased pricing on your profitability. All right, some thoughts on value creation. Uh, customer feedback, segregate your customers by needs and desires and build a customer value map. So let me run you through that. So in order to get a better understanding of your customers' needs and desires, you need to ask them more questions. You need to get to understand them better, and we do this by engaging with our customers. We can do it in one or two ways. We can do it through a quantitative questionnaire, that's a formal survey, or qualitative is where we actually engage with them and ask them questions. A good example of a qualitative questionnaire is what is called a win-loss survey. So where you win or lose a piece of business, you interview the person to understand what drove their decisions, how they evaluated value and price, and that gives you great insights into what your customers are thinking at a very critical point, which is the purchasing decision. It's good to get someone independent to do it, because they're not always likely to tell your sales rep the truth. Uh, more open to an independent person, and it's important to always start asking the value questions first. So start with, you know, what's important to you, how do you perceive delivery times before you get to price. We have a really great module in Catalyzer on doing customer surveys that Thilo created for us. So if you want to spend a little bit more time in this area, I'd suggest you get your coach to give you access to that module and go through some of the principles there. All right, needs-based segmentation. So we often think of our customers in these kind of classical needs, you know, size, 
geographic location industry. And so I want to get you thinking about your customers rather than in that kind of way, but grouping them rather by need. So here's a little example. All right, so I make some kind of pet product, and I could classify my customers as whether they own a small dog, a medium dog, or a large dog. However, that's got nothing to do with their needs. These are more common needs that dog owners have. All right, they have a need for a pet, a need for an employee, and some people a need for a child. Now that understanding gives you a much richer perspective of your customers and how do you create products and services that they will love. So start thinking about your customers from a need basis. So this particular company here did exactly that. So they've got three different customers and three different needs. So the top one they call overall performance driven and they're the ones that want everything. Certainty of delivery time, complete shipments, strong technical support. So they created a platinum program for them, which offered them all of this, but in return for a higher share of their wallet and spend. Then you've got those that just want the thing on time, and so they need a certainty of delivery. And this enabled customers to choose delivery time and provide a guarantee of that delivery, but for a different price. And then you've got the ones that you all know about, the price-driven customer, who wants low prices, so they've got a different offering. All right, so limited or no technical support, longer lead times, but for a lower price. So what this company has done is it's understood the needs of its different customers, it's created an offering that matches the needs, and the aim of this, I mean, if you've done it correctly, is if you remember the pricing graph, they've been able to capture profit along that graph, um, and obviously with this, the aim is that you would be able overall to increase profits and margins. So it's a different thought of how you approach your customers. All right, the final one I want to share with you is this customer value map. And the aim behind the value map is to put this on the table when you're thinking about pricing. So the way the value map works is on the, uh, the vertical, you've got the relative price, i.e., you know, what is people charging for the product or service, and across the, the horizontal axis, the relative value of that product or service. Then we've got here the fair value line. So the fair value line is where the price of the product and the value received are equal. It's fairly priced. So obviously, if I'm giving more value at a higher price, it's still a fair price. If, however, my product sits above this line, it's at a value disadvantage means I'm charging more than the value I'm giving, and if it's beneath the line, it's a value advantage, which means I'm giving more value than I'm charging, which obviously would be a potential to increase prices. So how do you use this? You would obviously need to get the prices of your competitors, so you could fill in this piece of the column. Then you would need to do an exercise, something along the lines of understanding what are the key service attributes that your customers look for, what do they value, You'd have to weight them in you know, level of importance. And then you'd need to get your competitors and you and score yourselves against the delivery of these values and then get a weighted score. So the 30% is time the 10. And you get a weighted score. Now, to, in order to do this, again, you need a deep understanding of your customers. What do they truly value in your product and service? And what is the order of magnitude so it's going to force you to think a lot more deeper around what is valuable to your customers. Once you've got that data, you can draw, uh, record it on this graph. And so what we see here, company C is at fair value. Even though its price is low, its value is less. Company A is actually giving more value than its um, price. So there's a pricing increase opportunity. And company B is not in particularly good shape there. Now, you're not going to, this is not an exact science, so you're not going to be able to plot it perfectly. You'll know whether you've got it right, because if you think you're here and you're giving more value than price and you're not gaining market share, then that's a, probably a pretty good indicator that you're fooling yourself. And maybe you're actually sitting more somewhere over here. But the beauty of doing this exercise is it's forcing you to think about value and price. So often when we price, we just think about cost and price. This is now forcing you to think about value and price relative to your 
competitors. All right, the final stage, and you should be doing these sequentially. So if you're more in the reaction stage, get the measured state first, then start thinking value, and then, you know, get to the scientific stage. All right, the scientific stage is complex. You need an engineer, not an accountant, to help you there. Um, so I've just taken one principle around scientific pricing. So the original science of pricing was that buyers and sellers had equal knowledge, and they acted rationally. <laughs> now, by the sounds of your laughs, you know that those assumptions are not true. And so that led to the development of what is known today as behavioral economics, i.e. how people actually behave and how that influences prices and demand and supply. And so we call it the strange psychology of pricing, but one of the underlying principles of, the, of that is this. The pain we feel from a loss is greater than the happiness we feel from a gain, even if they're the same magnitude. So if you had to receive a phone call and someone phoned you and told you you'd won a million rand. You would obviously be ecstatic. If two days later the same person phoned and told you they'd made a mistake and you hadn't won the million rand, you would obviously not be very ecstatic. But the day before the phone call, you didn't have a million rand, and the day after the phone call, you didn't have a million rand. But I think we'd all agree that the experience would be seriously negative. So what does that mean for pricing? The negative part is handing over the money. And that is more painful than the gain of what I'm going to get in return. So this is not about pricing. But if you want to save money, pay in physical cash and don't use your credit card because the pain of handing over those notes is a lot more painful than swiping the card and you will send, spend less. <laughs> that principle leads to potential advantages or things, one of the advantages, things you can do in pricing. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen these motor car offers with this 20,000 Rand cash back. Now, I've always been mystified by that, being an accountant, my logic is, why don't you just charge 20,000 less for the car? But clearly, I'm an accountant. And so, this is the psychology of it. If I give up the 4,500 there, 4,350, that's negative. And the car is roughly equal. So I'm sort of neutral. But now, if I chuck in the 20,000 on top, suddenly that positive feeling suddenly skyrockets, and the increase in that amount a month is not really noticeable. And so suddenly I'm going to be very excited because not only am I going to drive this sexy new car off the showroom floor, but I'm going to have 20 grand for a holiday. <laughs> There's a lot of science in behavioral science. The book to read on this is Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow. He doesn't talk about pricing in the book, <laughs> but he is the father of behavioral economics. All right, in conclusion. My aim today was to pique your interest in pricing to a degree that you would be interested in going on a journey, learning more, and finding out are there uh, aspects of pricing strategy and, and theory that could help you make more money in your business. Then. Price is equal to value. This is the key formula I want you to take away. How do you create value, communicate value, and retain value? I'm now going to pay you, play you a video. It's only a minute and a half. Then you're going to go on your break. If you have any questions, come ask me, but I just need to manage the time. So I'm going to play you the video, and then I'm giving you a task during the break, and then I'm going to get... I'll steal one minute from Jeff's time uh, to get your answers. All right, can we play the video?
All right, so for discussion in your break, whilst the lady on the right was very smart, she most likely would fall foul of the competition authorities in South Africa. <laughs> i.e. buying out all your com competitors, creating a monopoly, and then tripling your prices would um, probably breach the Competition Act. But she was smart nonetheless. So given that was her strategy, your discussion while you get your next cup of coffee is I want you to come back taking what you learned today. What advice would you give the two ladies to improve their pricing strategy? All right, if we can have you back in 10 minutes time and I'll find out what you think about how you're going to help these two ladies. By different clients, they can sell the same product but niching down into specific clients. Good. Absolutely. They need to move where the forces are weaker. Any other suggestions for the ladies? Hmm. Yes. Yes. How would you change the egg? <laughs> Spot on. Okay, um, you need to grade the eggs. So you have a grade one or grade two or grade three of the eggs, so then not all eggs are the same. Now, have any of you been shopping for eggs lately? That is exactly the answer. All right, you get free range eggs, grain fred eggs, jumbo eggs, regular eggs. I'm not certain if there's any difference in those eggs. <laughs> But they certainly serve different needs and different customers that have different needs. And the reason I know that there's these different eggs is because if I arrive home and I haven't bought free-range eggs, I'm in a lot of trouble. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Those are good answers. All right. Graham, thank you so much. Um, folks, as... Uh as promised, Graham would deliver a cracker for you. I've had already a number of requests as to whether his presentation will be available to you afterwards. The answer is yes. We will make this the full presentation available as a recording. Certainly you can see from what he said, there's probably a number of members of your team that you'd need to rope in if you really want to start tackling some of this pricing strategy. So we will make this video available to you so you can share it with your team members if you are keen to go on this pricing journey.